are we? <gasps> the Screaming Divas. And Screaming Divas! Ooh, that works. I haven't sung for like three weeks. Hey. <laughs> Who are we interviewing today? You know, I'm going to let you introduce him because you know him really well, but I fell in love with him in this interview, so. Yeah, Joan Matabosch who is the artistic director of Teatro Real in Madrid, Madrid, where I was just, Ooh. Carrie's gonna love me when I say this, where I was just singing, so sorry. Um, ding, it's five, fifth time you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie said apparently in the interview, I mentioned it quite a few times, but I was so excited that I was just there, <laughs> singing in a real opera house. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, it's super exciting. I'm like, meh, meh. I'm like all the other Americans that are like, yeah, good for you. You got to go there. Yeah. But what, what, Juan is such an inspiration. Absolutely. Wow. Carrie's, Carrie's only met him briefly in passing, but I, as she said, she's in love with him. He is the first artistic director of an opera house that after the pandemic, during the pandemic, opened their opera house. He figured it out. He figured out a way. He got everybody at the table to talk to each other, to figure out the best way to make it happen, to make art relevant, to make art available. And, and safe. And safe, thank you, and safe. So it's been really super cool to watch what he's done this whole time. And I was so glad that he wanted to join us on our sh with our shenanigans. Yay! Um, talk about it, because it's really exciting to know that it's happening. So, yay! Yeah, we have a great clip of him talking about why opera, not just opera, but the arts are so relevant to the world, not just right now, but in general. So yep. check it out. Here's a clip. Bing! Bing! <laughs> I love very much what Casper uh, Holton used to say, opera is a fitness center of the emotions. Uh, Beautiful. That's exactly what opera is. It's a fitness center of the emotions. <laughs> and I think we need that, absolutely. And when you have, when you know what that means, I yeah. think uh, you can't really li live without it. <laughs> I have to pull out the bell. Mm, okay, just ring it one time. Is that possible? Yeah. Hello, everybody. This is Sandra and Carrie. Please subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm done. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> See y'all next week. Bye. 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 Can you hear Hi. us? Hi. Hi. <laughs> Can you, you hear us? You, good. Okay. Good. We're having our coffee. Oh, yeah. Oh, I haven't. Uh, sorry. I, I was forgetting my drink. There oh, was there. nothing there, but anyway. Oh. <laughs> but anyway. I will pretend that. Okay. Oh, cheers. How, so are, how you? are you? Good. Good. This is Carrie Alkema. Hey. Yeah, this is Juan Matabash. Hi. How are you? Fine. Thanks. How are you doing? Yes. Fine. Great. Thank We're you for excited to talk. Can't wait. Yeah, we're excited to talk to you. Juwan agreed to do this interview when I was over in Madrid doing right. the amazing Balo production at the Teatro Real. Right. Thank, thank you for doing this and That's thank okay. you for having your theater open. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough times. Huh? I, it's, it's really not easy, but well, yes, we are, we are trying to be open and we are successful at, up to the moment to really to go on to go on and and to do it with all the with all the precautions that we need you need to you know, it's indispensable in this situation because of course the health uh, security is a priority for for everybody but sure. uh, while we are trying to find a way to protect our our artists our staff and our public and at the same time to find a solution to remain open and and we want really to go on like this uh, as far as we can awesome well, I'm just so grateful that you wanted to talk with us because to get such a wonderful, um, it, your information as a European house versus the informations we, uh, information we have as an Amer oh, in, in America as American opera houses, 
Um, I really would love to, I think Sondra and I talked about this, would love to start with where it all began for you, how it happened, you know, as it all came down in the March, pandemic. For the pandemic with the in March stopping. Oh my God, I am like being a horrible today. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, Karen's I mean, excited. We, we had a complete, a complete closure during, during month when, and, and that was very sad because we were doing, a, we were going to do a premiere uh, that happened. Uh, we had to cancel everything the day of the pre-general, really. Um, okay. That was a new production of a completely unknown piece uh, by Spanish Baroque, oh. by Francesco Corselli. I know what he knows it. I know you. I, I know it. it's called Achille in Shiro. But cool. it was a very interesting thing. It was a big event. It was the first time that that opera was going to be on stage again after after about more than three hundred years. Whoa. So it was a it was a really interesting thing. I mean, we are we have not really canceled it. We have to okay. postpone it. Uh, 2023 so that will happen again in case you want to attend no problem okay. that's going to be in our stage we, we we need to wait a bit because of course the situation and to find to find uh, availability of everybody which was involved in that production again mm -hmm. for a couple of months it, it has not been easy but in 2023 we're going to have that again so we had a complete closure but we could uh, find a way already in june to rehearse oh. and in july in july 1st we we started uh, a run of performances of La Traviata. Um, right. Did, uh, 27 performances of La Traviata oh, from the amazing. 1st to the 29th of July. Uh, well, it was a sort of, I mean, it was with full cast. It was with the orchestra, with the chorus. Uh, we announced that that was going to be concert performances, uh, but it was a sort of concert semi-staging. Yeah. Uh, but uh, of course, before we decided which which sort of performances we were going to offer, we spent the end of May and the and the, and the May the, the early June uh, drafting a contingency plan of protocols for the resuming work. Okay, uh, okay. that was very hard and very delicate. Uh, it was done together with the general direction, with the Secretaria General, with the unions, mm -hmm. and especially with uh, a, a, a health. Uh, committee of experts uh, of, of mm. different, different medical doctors of the different hospitals in Madrid. Uh, we, we nominate that internal committee and they uh, collaborate with our health and safety committee uh, to, to really to return into the activity, implementing a, some, some issues, for example, a serology test for, mm -hmm. for workers, for clinicians, for administrators. Everyone, did of, everyone have to get tested, Juan? Well, I mean, uh, that, that was a condition. I mean, to come to join the building of the theater, you had to be tested. Otherwise, no way. Uh, and we, we imposed that serology test. Yes, I mean, I think everybody was excited to, to go back to work. And, yeah. and we were able to really to do the serology test to everybody. Then we, we are doing, of, of course, temperature tests mm -hmm. uh, each, each time that uh, somebody accesses the theater. Uh, then there was also a strategy of reincorporation in three phases with some specific protocols of distance, of disinfection, of hygienic measures, of uh, use of masks, of course. Then there were specific protocols for orchestra and for chorus around uh, all the organization of rehearsals, uh, the minimum distances and the placing of panels between musicians mm -hmm. and in singers of the chorus. I mean, uh, but it how are you able to do Traviata, but only with these very strong um, measures of health? So you were shut down from March until June first, correct? Well, more than yeah, June yeah. And then, could you h help explain to an American that knows American opera um, business side of it well, with unions and all those things? What is there were key words that you said in there that I just wanted to ask a hundred questions. Your, <laughs> you, the, the unions versus us, how were you able to have everyone come to the table together to make all of this work so that everyone agreed to all the same rules? How did, are your unions the same as our unions? Are your do you have unions? Yes. Right. Well, yes, of course we have unions. I, I think the difference between between probably the Met is that in the Met they have like many unions in, inside the same building. Right. Uh, they like have like I don't know, fifteen unions or 15. something. Like this. Here uh, we have uh, one committee, and that committee has several uh, syndicates, let's say, but it's one committee, one union committee, let's say, and you have to agree with them. So the the way we did that was basically by convincing them that. 
the, the, we, we externalized really all the health protocol. There was a committee of experts which were basically um, medical experts from several hospitals in Madrid. They did really the protocol and, they, okay. and then we did the, implement, the implementation of that in the house. I mean, I have to say that you can't do the same in, in, in different institutions. I mean, every, I, I don't think that what we did can be done probably in, in other places. I mean, it's, it depends a lot in things like, for example, the architecture of the place. I mean, it's, oh. it, uh, there, are, there are issues, which is, uh, I mean, every place is very specific about w exactly what you need to do in order to preserve safety. So what we did is these uh, medical experts, they did that protocol, and then we talked with the unions and then in a, in a way that they could be convinced that done like this, this could be done in a way that it was safe for everybody. But of course, safety was was the priority. I of mean, course. I not have done anything. Right. And you actually, there were no reported cases from the Traviata, was there? No, I mean, not no, that I read no, in the no, news. No, no, because also in the orchestra pit, I mean, we, for the orchestra, for example, the solution was a very logical one. We, we did, um, the, the orchestra pit was expanded mm -hmm. at the maximum size of, I mean, uh, we did Traviata with the pit the size of the pit was like the size of the pit that we would do uh, the frau and a shatten or which would you could accommodate 120 musicians in normal circumstances before the mm -hmm. before the COVID and now we only needed I mean Traviata you can do Traviata with 45 musicians so at the end uh, there was the, the safe necessary space each music stand could be individual and all necessary uh, distance between players were, cool. were, were, were there. The only thing is that, of course, we were losing some of the rows of our packet uh, seats, of course, because, because yeah. that was, in this case, part of the pit. And in right. normal circumstances, Traviata would not need that. But we did, done like this, it really worked. That with, with the chorus, I mean, something similar with the chorus, we, did, we placed the chorus yeah. in a way that there was a distance of um, around two meters between them and that, that could- Yeah, and it, but you took, you took the initiative when other opera houses didn't, you really took the risk and it, and it was a risk. I mean, you could have been shut down if just one person had gotten COVID. So we applaud you for taking oh. that risk and, and really, making it happen because you pushed, I know you, and I, I know you, <laughs> you organized everything and got everybody, pushed everybody together to make this happen because you're so passionate about the art form. I mean, we, we thought that uh, we had to find a way to, to keep the theater open uh, in spite of the circumstances, or at least at the very moment that the circumstances allow us to find a way in order to open to open the theater, but I, as I insisted before, it's very difficult to say that you can't do the same in other places. I think every theater is, I mean, they, theaters are so different, and um, very often what is uh, possible in one place right. is just, um, completely um, uh, impossible in another place. And and the architecture of the place, as I said, is. But I think it was it was it's important to try to to keep fighting. It's important to to also to that this situation, which is terrible, at the, at the end is also a way to reinvent ourselves, to right. find a solution, uh, to do things in a way that it's not the way I would love to do them, but I think sure. it's better to try to do it like that way than to, than, to, than to close the theater. And also because of the public, because of the artists, I mean, the artists have suffered that, so oh. much. I mean, what, what, I, I don't need to tell you, but I mean, some of the of the of the of the singers of the artists which came for Traviata or for or for Baloi Mascara or now for Rosalka, they have been not working for six months or even more. So I mean, for the artists, this has been a real, real drama, a real tragedy. Yeah. So we need to be sensible to that. So if, if there is a way, if there is no way, there is no way. But right. if there is a way to open the theater and to find the solution, I think we need to try. And we, and we need to take the risk. Also for the donors, I mean, uh, that, what, that was not really the first reason we, 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 we did what we did. But at the end, we have, we have found that the fact of being open is also a big encouragement for our donors. I mean, uh, yeah. we, we need them now more than ever. And the mm -hmm. fact of go on in spite of the circumstances is helping us to keep the contact and the encouragement uh, for them to remain as yeah. donors. And we really need them because uh, I, you know, I know that in Europe, 
many theaters don't depend so much on donors. Like we, our budget, 25% of our income. But you're from, answering all our questions. <laughs> I know. Yeah. No, no, I wanted to know more that. More from donors and from public money. So at the end, we have 25% from donors and 24% of, of subsidies. So at the end, for donors for us are essential. And that's, and what we are doing really is helping us, at least in our situation and where we are in Madrid, it's really helping us to keep donors uh, like uh, I mean, very yeah. much in, in a symphony with the theater. Um, what is the percentage of seats that you have to really sell to keep the company financially uh, soluble? Is that the right word? Well, in a theater like this, like in any other, you have your overheads, and then uh, in, in the activity, if you, in, I mean, of course, the the margin that we would have done with Traviata, for example, as, uh, as an example, Traviata. Traviata, we, I was planning before the COVID, uh, the margin of Traviata would have been around uh, 2 million euros, let's say, a positive margin for, for something like Traviata. I need to okay. do, at the end of the, of, the, of the year, like 4 million margin positive in okay. order to, uh, in order to, to keep the, the, the finances of the theater uh, okay. Uh, so in this case, of course, because of the reduction of the income by box office, mm -hmm. that we sell only 50% of the seats, the, the, the margin was not uh, 2 million, as I expected. It was only one th 150,000 euros. Uh, which is, of course, much less, but I mean, at the end, it's a positive margin. I mean, it's not, of course, I have much less margin than I would have expected before the COVID, but financially, for us at least, I, maybe not in other places, but for us at least, mm -hmm. it makes no sense to close the theater. I mean, the margin is positive. It's a little bit positive. Yeah, okay. uh, it's not what I would love for a piece like Traviata, but uh, if we would have close the theater, we would have got the deficit that we have now, please 150,000 euros. So at the end, to close the theater makes financially no sense. Okay. So uh, we want to, we talked with Peter Gelb last week uh, about the Metropolitan Opera and about North American Opera. And we know that the structure of opera houses are completely different in Europe. And I, we read all this on social media about, you know, Amer, why are the North American opera houses not opening? Why are they not opening? And why are the opera houses in Europe opening? Can you explain to us the structure of, you are the artistic director, correct, of the Teatro yeah. Real. But there is, there is somebody above you in the position, correct? And yeah. you are structured differently than North American opera houses, correct? Well, I think that uh, what is different, and I think that um, that uh, Peter Gell mentioned it a bit, in, in Europe, for, for some theaters, the fact of uh, reopen the theater and to make the effort and take the risk of trying to, to maintain the activity in spite of the yeah. difficulties of the circumstances is helping, I would say, the whole cultural environment of the country to somehow uh, have a sense of continuity, uh, a hope of, so um, I think that, I mean, they are not, of course, they, they, they understand perfectly, uh, the politicians, they understand perfectly, if there is no way for us to go on. I mean, that can happen. I mean, if there is no way, there is no way. I'm not, right. going to, I'm not Don Quixote. I mean, uh, <laughs> we, are going, we are going to fight in, in the limits of the reasonable. I mean, out of the reasonable, I'm not going to move a single as not anything. I mean, right. we are going just to stop and we are going home and no, that's not the end of the world. Sure. But, but if there is a way to go on, we are going to try that way because, um, because I mean, the, 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 to, to survive the crisis, we are, going, we are going to end stronger if we make that effort. We are going to keep the public more with us. Of course, that there will be now lots of problems to get the public back to theaters. But if you make the effort of trying to give a continuity, it's going to be easier for the donors, clearly what I said before. Mm -hmm. uh, and also because this is an example and an inspiration. And I would say not only for other theaters, but also for other cultural institutions. So at the end, yes. the fact that Teatro Real is open has somehow inspired other institutions in Spain and maybe also other theaters. Yes. Uh, uh, straight theaters uh, also, I mean, other opera theaters in Spain, they are also trying to find a way to keep going with all the limitations, all the problems, yeah. but try to keep going. And I think 
this has a lot to do with the fact that we tried what we tried in July. That we said, right. we are going to do it. And now, more or less, most theater are also trying to find yeah. a way to go on. So I think that's good for everybody. It's good for everybody. And I have to say that there has not been a single problem of, uh, in, in, in theaters of, about the COVID, not really. I mean, it's everybody wears masks. I mean, the, the measures are very strict. There, I, I can attest anything. to that. Very strict. Yeah, you know it. I mean, it's, uh, you, you walk you in the door and it continuously. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not, I, I think we are doing it with all safe, uh, con safety and whatever, but of course it's easier to close and, and to wait. Mm -hmm. But I think you are, I mean, I don't know, I, probably, I'm afraid that to do that, you, you're going to pay it later. I, no, I agree with you. H how do you, what, I feel like your government actually supports the arts and, and the importance behind it culturally is enormous. What would you say to the governments or to actually people, because I've read these comments online, that really don't think that the arts are essential, that um, you know they think, tough for you singers, you all need to find a different career and make some money. I mean, it's not our fault that you chose this career. So, um, what's yeah, your, why do you think that? the arts are so essential? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, um, arts are essential and arts are essential because uh, art is uh, the, 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 the best way that we have to observe ourselves, our reality, our world, uh, out of ourselves in a way that its expression is expression of ourselves and opera is a marvelous example I mean not only opera I mean I'm talking about art in general yes uh, painting literature theater uh, mm -hmm. dance I mean whatever you want all all this is absolutely important for the human being because what is different from a person and from than from from an animal is the way that we have the ability to see ourselves mm -hmm. expressive through art. Art is helping us to watch ourselves. And uh, I th that's absolutely, that's very, very important. I mean, of course, I can imagine that, that um, well, okay, some people will probably disagree with this and they think that this is just uh, whatever, elitist or a luxury. But I think that what the government has to, to, to achieve is to put that uh, potential uh, on the uh, that in a way that everybody can get to this, not just to, to. I mean, it would be really. I mean, humanity would be not the same without art. I think we have to defend that. I mean, this is a tough moment for arts, but I think we need to also defend a conception of uh, what opera is as an art form. Not it's, a, it's an art form which which reflects re really what 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 we la what we live. And uh, we invest in people, in, in pieces which are, we, we want new pieces, of course, but yeah. also how pieces, how operas which were composed 100 years ago or 300 years ago in the case of Akira and Shio are still incredibly relevant about what we are, how we feel. I love very much what uh, Casper Holton used to say, opera is a fitness center of the emotions. Uh, Beautiful. That's exactly what opera is. It's a fitness center of the emotions. <laughs> and I think we need that, absolutely. And when you have, when you know what that means, I yeah. think uh, you can't really li live without it. No. Well, it's, I when I was there, Madrid went into another semi-lockdown for the Balo. And I remember talking with you and saying, are we okay? Are we okay? And you said to me, the government of Spain says that arts are essential to the community. And that wrapped it all up for me because I said, yes, exactly. And do you, we're having here in North America now issues with funding in schools. Children aren't even being taught about music. Do you still have funding for the arts in schools there in Spain? Is it being cut as well? Well, I mean, there is a lot of, I mean, much more could be done, I have to say. Huh? Sure. I don't think that we live in either world in Europe. Uh, but, but, uh, but yes, I think that arts are, I mean, every, I think most people would agree that arts are, are essential. The only thing is that it's not only about saying it, it's about really feeling it. It's about, yeah. uh, it's about doing something in a way that, that, that this can be, uh, 
available for everybody. So I think now we have several possibilities apart from the fact that theaters exist and the, the seasons and whatever. You, we have also digital platforms. We have uh, streaming. Yeah. We have Talk to us about that. What are you doing digitally? We are doing that a lot. And I think it's a very, it's a fantastic way to, of course, it's not the same. Of course, it's not the same to attend a, a live performance than a very nice uh, broadcasting or, or, a li or a live broadcasting of, of a big ev operatic event. But at the end of nowadays, these things are done in such a wonderful way that very often it's also a fabulous experience. It's not the same experience, but mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a very, very good experience. When so you have a, a fabulous artist, I mean, to, to, to attend a performance by Sondra Radbanovsky on a theater is amazing, it's incredible, the voice, the whatever. But, uh, when you, but you don't have these close-ups which shows what an actress, what an artist, how deeply you have the role. This maybe even in a, in a very good broadcast, in a very light, maybe you get it even more that in a theater. So yes, I think that nowadays both are very different ways of approaching into opera but both are great and we need now to make very clear that uh, that i mean having a very good audiovisual uh program is essential for an opera theater i think it's a matter of surviving really at the end for everybody for yeah. for theaters which depend on, on 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 donors and for theaters who depend on public money because at the end public money comes because it's a service to the community and mm -hmm. the service can't be just for the few people that attend a performance. The right. service must be available for everybody. Yeah, and that's that. why these people which will never attend a performance, uh, they still can have that service at their disposal. And that makes sense that they pay part of their taxes for that service. Okay. Opera uh, for everybody. Every, for, for everyone. So when we were talking with um, Peter Gelb, he said that he and I disagreed about when opera can be available again in the United States that I felt like the doors, once they opened, the opera house would be flooded. He disagreed with me because he said the majority of their patrons that come and buy a ticket are about around 57 years and older. Is, have you found for your own opera house what your average age is? And is that why you feel that people might not be coming in droves back to the theaters because age and COVID Related, yeah, yeah. Just being afraid of coming back because our performances were all sold out of the Balo, and sold out quickly. So yeah. I don't, I don't know if I agree with you, Juan. I think people are going to come back. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I, I, I think that that in our experience, they they come back. The only thing is that, of course, we can accommodate only part of the people which wants to come back because yeah. our, our capacity now is much less. I mean, we are now working about it was fifty percent, and now it's a bit more. Yeah, now, but our theater now is about 60, 60 maybe sixty-two percent maximum okay. of capacity. So uh, at the end, we we can't accommodate. But yes, they are they are coming back. I mean, of course, you have to convince them. I mean, there were no virus cases associated with the performances. It was very clear for us, as I said before, that the safety measures could guarantee the safety yeah. of the public. Uh, otherwise, we would not have done it. Uh, and the public was wearing masks all the time. The yeah. entrance of the auditorium and the exit was in a strict order, organized by, by people from our staff. Um, then, for example, the use of restrooms was also through a very strict protocol. Uh, we added also some extra restrooms in spite of the reduction of the capacity. We had more extra restrooms in spite of the, 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 the mm -hmm. It was much less than, than, than before the COVID. Uh, then there were staff people to disinfect uh, restrooms every, after every use. Yeah. The access to the foyers of the theater is also under a very strict control in your ticket. You are informed about which is the foyer you could access during the interval to be sure that no foyer has too many people. Oh. And, and, and no backstage guests? I mean, there yeah, are many things. We yeah, have no the history. auditorium with lots of clips about the opera and the We try to convince, to suggest the people not to go out in spite that there are some, I mean, there is a, maybe a, uh, an interval, but we try to invent things that they don't go out mm -hmm. unless it's absolutely necessary to use the restrooms. And, and the intervals are longer than usual to guarantee that everybody can get back to in place and to be sure that there was enough um, time for whatever was needed. So I think um, at the end, um, clearly, if somebody has been in the in the theater, they see they can see by themselves that that, that I mean, for for safety reasons or for 
there is no reason to to be afraid to come to come to the opera i think it's i mean there was one of the doctors of the medical committee by the way yeah uh he said in the newspaper i, I was Traviata, funny, right? I said something like in madrid if you want to feel really secure and safe go to, I have it. Real to attend an opera yeah <laughs> let's not hesitate to get the ticket for the ballo and mascara that wants to be another step to that conquest and that has nicola luizotti in a colossal cast nor for the imminent Rusalka by Loy, which will probably be one of the best shows that will have premiered throughout the year internationally. That is what the doctor said. <laughs> well, yeah. well, yes, that's so, a quotation. So, yeah. I mean, but, but what is your average audience age? Do you, do you, know, do you have an oh, well, idea? Because it is. seems I mean, I don't younger have, to me. I don't have the answer here now. I think right. it's but probably the, the, the average. I, I mean, you know what happens in the opera. I mean, uh, yeah. we have some performances which are, uh, special for a uh, young public. We had right. Pablo Mascara. Our, our first performance was was for people under 35 years old. And of course, it was a bit uh. it was cheaper. Right? It was a, at mm -hmm. a special price. It was about... But the energy know. was amazing. They were it was fabulous. And yelling and... Yes, we want that public every night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's fabulous. They, 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 they are fab really incredible. But yes, I mean, the, the, of, uh, the, I, probably the, the, the average age is probably not that much. But you know what happens in opera? I mean, I think that we have to, 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 to be used that it's very normal that uh, when, if you, when you are young, you are used to it, you, are, you know what is the art form mm -hmm. and you have a contact with the art form, there will be a yeah. moment where you do other things in your life, but in a certain age, you come back and you are there again. So I think what is very important is to have the younger audience knowing what opera and what art in general is Yes. We want them to know, to, to have this experience. Mm -hmm. We understand that uh, in a certain moment after they are going to do other things, they have that in their minds. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a certain moment, they are going to be there again. So I'm not that, I don't find that such, a, I mean, what happens what was with the audience of 57 years old is perfect. They are perfectly welcome. We love them as well. <laughs> we love them all. Just please come. Yeah, no, please come. <laughs> Just come. Yeah. Um, I don't want to like keep asking about COVID, but I am curious just for, from a singer standpoint of view, if I was coming to your theater now for, let's say a production coming in October, what would you tell me the safety protocol calls are? What do I have to do and what should I expect from the company in your oh, we, we would send you a whole protocol of, of how you have to behave. Uh, that you have to wear a mask in every moment, except at the moment where, where, the, where, where you, the, the rehearsal starts, mm -hmm. that you have to wear a mask again when the rehearsal ends. You are going to be told that you are, you are going to be tested. And they, I mean, depending on the production, they tell you exactly, but every whatever week or... We, 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 we find also a, a way that the tests are compatible with, uh, with the planning of the rehearsals. Okay. But you have to test regularly. Okay. Uh, and uh, also on the procedures, because... I mean, even if somebody's test and, and, and somebody's positive, I mean, we have a whole protocol to react. I mean, if this happens, okay. I mean, that person is isolated, we do the test to all the rest, that person is on is 10 days uh, there, and then after that, they are tested again. Normally, they, it's, then it's negative. And, uh, um, and then again, they, the, there is a reincorporation of the artist into the rehearsal. So mm -hmm. I think there is a very strict, but a very clear protocol and right. don't panic. I mean, don't, oh, sure. you don't need to panic. It's just that it's a very yeah. tough situation. That situation, we need to face it directly, yep. how to behave in such a situation. And we just do all the, all the protocol from the beginning till the end. And at the end, that makes the theater safe or at least as safe yeah. as any other thing that you can do in your life right. or i would say yeah. better, really well everyone okay. believed in it they did and, that's, and it then was, that's where it was able to happen okay but i have a million dollar question for you are you okay. ready for this <laughs> okay so when you say everyone has to wear a mask is it a mask like this or is it a mask like this oh no no <laughs> go for it no. honestly carrie everyone believed in it and I will tell you, having been there, sorry, Juwan, but <clears throat> I wanted Juwan to answer that question. <laughs> well, it's true. I saw it. So I will tell Donna you. Donna knows it as, as well as me. <laughs> the mask. I mean, you, you, you wore your mask every time I saw you. Juwan had a mask on. And oh. he set the example for the theater. And I'm telling you, the security guard, Carrie, when you walk in that theater, the security guard meets you. 
and says, here's a mask. You have to wear the mask of the theater, which are the blue. Yeah. Not your own mask, but the medical oh, mask. That's interesting. Okay. They hand that to you. They tell you, here's the hand sanitizer. Sanitize your hand. I mean, it starts with the security guard. Nice. Yeah. You go through, everyone in the theater has a mask on. They believe in it. The only time I didn't have a mask, I had my mask on until I walked onto the stage right as I made my vocal entrance. When I made my vocal entrance, my dresser was there, took my mask away, threw it away. The moment I walked off stage, my dresser was there again with a new fresh mask, put it on, and everybody followed that protocol. I swear to you, it was- I love that. 100% followed. It, no, because I love that. believed that, it. Exactly the protocol. So you did it. <laughs> How it you, and for example, for the dancers, we had dancers in Baloi Mastra. Yes. And for the dancers, the solution was a bit special because they were dancing with mask, but in the mask, they had a photo of, the, of their own um, face. That face. Yeah. In a Ooh. way okay. that depending on the lighting, you could imagine that there was no mask, but there was a mask. The only yeah, yeah. thing is that there was a certain confusion because the mask was themselves. And we are using that again for our next production that everybody's going to wear, everybody in the chorus is going to, uh, also in the chorus in this, no, in the chorus in Balu Masculine, no, they were singing. No, without, but they were distanced. They were all distanced. With all, all the distance. But in the next production that we are going to do, that's the going Rusalka. to be without the, the, the no, Rusalka is, the chorus is out of stage. That's not a problem. But in the next one, in Don Giovanni, we are going to do the whole production like it is, but with every boy in the chorus wearing a mask. And in the mask, there will be a photo of each member of the chorus in a way that probably, I mean, not, I mean, of course, that's not what I say is not exact because I'm, somehow you, 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 you can see that it's a mask, but it's not clear. I mean, you have a, the impression right. yeah. that there are no masks. Where did, your, cool. where did your passion for opera come from? Like what <laughs> you are such, no, you really are very passionate about it. And it's been your whole life and career. Where, where did well, that yeah, I mean, from? yes, I mean, yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I'm in opera for a while now, yes. But yes, I love it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a passion for me from all my life. Not only opera, I mean, I have always yeah. been a passionate of arts. I, I've been a passionate of theater, of music, of operas, of course, of dance. Uh, a lot of theater. I mean, I love theater. I mean, really, my first big, big, big passion was was theater, and I used to travel everywhere to to attend fabulous performances of great, great actors and actresses and and directors, and and I've loved that all my life. Uh, also, I come from a family which is very interested in arts. They love it. They they more books. In the in the case of my parents, they they love books and old books, especially, and they are bibliophiles and they they love those. And uh, well, I've been surrounded all, all my all my life with a passion for for this so at the end what happens if I, I i think that if you love every performing art form you end by being passionate about opera because at the end in opera you have a bit of everything so yeah. i think it's a logical end uh and, and that's exactly what happened to me but i love theater i mean in madrid or everywhere i mean when i go to a, to attend a performance in uh, london or in new york or whatever i try to see whether at the same time i can attend one of the really interesting uh, theater performances sure Broadway well it shows in, in the productions that you choose and and the singers that you choose okay put me aside but you have such a great rounded plethora of singers, but it's not just one type. You really do choose all different types of singers and all different types of productions, new and modern productions, more traditional productions. And you give the audience there in Madrid a, a real treat because you give them everything. And I appreciate that. So thank you. Really. Thank you. No, but we try to, what we try to do here is basically, um, I mean, opera, I mean, there are Opera can be even defined in different ways. I mean, the opera is not just one concrete thing. I mean, there are different approaches or definitions of what opera is. I, I, I love to be a bit uh, eclectic on that. I mean, mm -hmm. I, love, uh, I love great singers. I love when, I mean, when you are singing, uh, well, I also Kirsty, I saw you in Baloi Mascara in Barcelona, by the way, you sang Baloi Mascara with Bexala and with Carlos Alvarez. So I'm talking yes, about- Yes, she did. Uh, anyway, I'm um, sorry, that was not when, one of my when, better when moments. You see a wonderful <laughs> singer, 
I love it. I mean, I enjoyed every minute of it. I mean, I was born in at, attending performances by great singers of the times like Caballé or Victoria de Los Angeles or, or the, all the big ones of those times. I mean, uh, and of course, all the, 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 all the generation of the Domingos, the Pavarotti's, the, the Jaime Ragai, the Carreras, all, the, all wow. these marvelous singers, Pilar Orengar. Anyway, so I love, I love uh, great singers, but I love great theater as well. And I think that, uh, I think that uh, the, what is very important is when you do a project in an opera house, everything has to have uh, a structure, a coherence. And you need really to understand if you are doing a, um, a show uh, with a repertoire which is for great singers to perform, or if you are doing an incredible theatrical, dramaturgical work mm -hmm. in a way that in that case, the really important thing is the ensemble concept, the fact that we are all working together around a dramaturgy and a director, and I also love that. And I, I not, not, not in every piece you can do both things. I mean, if you do Norma, to do an ensemble piece would be a ridiculous idea. And if you do uh, Rusalka or not- Rusalka, yeah, I was just gonna in both, say. In both ways. But if you do, I don't know, whatever, uh, Le Dialogue de Carmelite, you need an ensemble, an right. ensemble conception, because otherwise, I mean, no, or even a Mozart opera. I mean, no Mozart opera allows a big diva show. I mean, you need really an ensemble. Otherwise, yeah, right. you are losing 75% uh, of what the piece means. And Absolutely. What the piece. So you, you realize that. Very, to have a very clear idea of what you want. And when, when you want something and you know exactly what, I think all the decisions are incredibly easy to make because uh, everything comes by itself and it's a consequence of the original idea. Beautiful. Yeah, love it. So how does opera go forward? Why do you see the future of opera? I mean, is it exactly what you just described? Do you think we need to change? I mean, COVID aside. Yeah. Well, I mean, COVID, I mean, I, 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 I'm afraid that COVID will have a influence in the, in the, in the, in the future of opera, of course. But um, I'm very optimistic about a future of opera if we are talking in medium term. I mean, I think we are going to have some tough years, I mean, now, yeah. because of course, the, the situation in the next years is going to be very difficult. Probably there will be uh, changes, there will be theaters which are probably going to change a lot or mm -hmm. I hope close. not to here or to close, mm -hmm. I hope not. But, but I mean, probably we are going to, to see some big changes in the world of opera. But I don't think that the art form is in danger. I think we will little by little get back where we were. Uh, probably some things will change forever. I don't know. I don't know whether contracts with artists are going to change or not. Maybe you can tell that to me more than me to you. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. I but, think we need to change. Yeah, the, the, that whole force majeure clause in our contracts. Yeah, that for example, but also some other things. For example, yeah. uh, when we did Achille and Shiro, I remember, because of course very often uh, opera manager, like artistic directors like me, we are forced by, by force. We are I mean, agents normally want absolutely that we pay performances and not rehearsals, and they want to charge a fee per performance and uh, rehearsals as less as possible. So that's probably going to change in the future, but because what happened with the, well, I don't know, it's going to change. My, my, my impression is that it's going to change for a few months. I, well, I think so too, we yeah. Were in a few years, but now what happened to, to many theaters is that they were rehearsing, they were going to have a premiere, and because they had contracts only with performances, what, how could they pay the artists for six or five weeks of rehearsals that are not, are not in their contracts? Right. So yeah. that was, I mean, we find a solution doing new contracts for everybody in Achille and Shido in a way that we considered the salary of the artists, the amount of the performances that they did spread right. in, the whole, in the whole period of availability of the artists, which is a logical way because yes. means the artist is working in a theater for maybe, I don't know, a month and a half. Right. And that's the salary. The yeah. salary is not the night you are singing Achille and Shiro. Right. That's nonsense. But of course, many contracts, because of the pressure of some agents, are done in a way which are really nonsense. And in a situation like this, it's terribly against the artist because some theaters could not find a way to pay them. We did. Right. We it's found good. a way. But some theaters really did not found a legal way to, to pay the artists for the services they have done, in spite, even if there was no premiere because of the, of the right. COVID. I thought that that was the companies that decided that. I didn't realize that that was the agents and the managers that were fighting for per well, performance I mean, contracts. You know how, 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 the, how this works. The, if you have a contract <laughs> paying basically the performances and not the rehearsals is yeah. much easier than to go to a theater and to say, oh, I'm sorry, the first week of rehearsals, 
Oh, oh yeah, and, okay, okay. But at the end, <laughs> you are paying the same right. because it's very difficult to make. So that's that's how how this world works. And I yeah. think in a in a in the situation we are facing, that's not good for the theaters clearly, but for the artists, it's also not very good. Right. No. I agree. And you know, I think I think we're going to see rehearsal periods being shortened just because of the the expense of it all for the theater, for the artists, all of that, maybe in the next few years. But no. I, I, Carrie and I both love to rehearse. I mean, we, we're strange, no. we're strange I, animals. I, but I, we, I find that sad because if I had to do a shortened rehearsal with somebody like David McVicker, that would be heartbreaking because this man is so detail oriented and really every show he puts on, yeah. whether you like it or not, is a true story. And so to lose rehearsal time with somebody as brilliant as that is, is because of finances is heartbreaking. Well, but yeah, I think you are right. I think that most artists love to rehearse. I mean, very often it's, it's basically that we are all of us in, in, inside a system, which is a bit complicated to, to, to handle when you have to feed offers that you have in between uh, previous engagements and mm -hmm. uh, see at, at the mm -hmm. end, but yes, I think that maybe that there will be some some changes in this in this in this line. Um, maybe we are going to face also changes in the audiovisual rights uh, because mm -hmm. audiovisual right. rights are more and more essential for theaters. So very often, I, I, I have the impression that in the future, uh, probably for some theaters, uh, there will be no way to go on with a project unless mm -hmm. you can really have a minimum of audiovisual rights to. To yeah. justify really the public money that you that you that you get because right, yeah. but because of what, what, what I was saying before, but my impression is that really we need to uh, we need to work a lot in this tough moment to get back where we were and if possible to you to 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 be in a better in a better position maybe also to try to open also our theaters to more. Uh, contemporary opera to more. I mean that's essential. It's always yeah. essential. We have. Uh, great composers around and it's very important that this situation which is a, the perfect situation for some managers to try to survive just doing Tosca and La Boheme. I think we need to really understand that if we want opera to be, to be relevant in the future we need also I'm very much in favor of Tosca and La Boheme that's nothing <laughs> against those operas. I just <laughs> say we can't do only this. Mm -hmm, we right. need to open our theaters to other repertoires to other to other um, even controversial uh, proposals that uh, who knows in the future if that's going to be settled in the repertoire it's just going to be but we need we need that we are uh, doing, for example, now in the next month, two contemporary operas, and I'm very, very happy that we go on with that. We are going to have one is going to be a premiere of a, of an opera by called Marie, and the other is going to be a new opera by by called, called Transit. So I, I think it's very important to 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 have a vision about what the art form is, and not just to. I mean, otherwise, otherwise, uh, I mean, the worst thing that opera can do is to become irrelevant, just a collection of uh, museum pieces. Yeah. That's, uh, that's really we love you. a very good excuse to, to not have opera anymore because, uh, because sure. who's going to be interested on that? No, I love does, you, Juan. Thank does you. That, does that also include, you know, diversity across your stages too? Um, but, I mean, that's a huge deal in issue. It, I, don't, I wish it wasn't. I mean, I wish that we had fixed this many, many years ago, but we haven't in this country in America. So is that something that is just considered and talked about in your opera house too? Diversity? Yes. Of course. Well, I mean, you are talking about, yes, of course we are. Diversity is another, I mean, at the end, an opera house is a place where you have, it's very important that you have there a vision, uh, some, how do you say that? Uh, a vision, uh, an example of what the community uh, from the opera house belongs to. It's very important that do you have there a reflection, something which yeah. you have there a resume of what the community is. So yes, I mean, it's yeah. very important that the diversity of the community, you can see that diversity also in the public and in the artists which are in the Opera House. Right. Of course, that, that's an effort from the Opera House because you need to, I mean, uh, um, but it's, it's very, very important to keep that in mind. It's one of the important it's another of important reasons for the Opera House to, to keep on existing. Thank well, um, I know that we've never met, but I've followed what you've done with the Opera House, um, especially since COVID. And 
Um, I just, you know, personally, I know from many other singers want to thank you for what you've done. Um, artists, everybody, stage management, the whole thing. Thank you for having the vision and the drive and the passion to make art still not only relevant, but happening in your city. And um, I just really, I'm so grateful and so thankful. And I'm hoping that many other companies can learn from what you've done, because um, we have no idea how long COVID is going to be around or when we're going to get a vaccine and we can't let this art form die. So I'm grateful and so thankful. And I hope when I ever see you in person, I can give you a hug for that. So <laughs> please, I can't wait. I already did it for you, Carrie. I have them for you. Do you have five more minutes, Juan, for some quick, fun, rapid fire questions? Yes, of course. OK, so we're going to ask you similar questions that we asked Peter Gell because we thought okay. they were kind of fun. Yes. So, okay. who is your favorite non-living diva? Oh, favorite non-living diva. Well, of course, I mean, the easiest uh, answer is Maria Callas, of course, what can you say? But <laughs> I would say, why not? I mean, Maria Callas, but I, I spent all my my childhood listening to, to Montserrat Caballé. I mean, yeah. I love her. I mean, I, I do too. Very unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, marvelous performances of her at the Liceo. But also Victoria de Los Angeles, which by the way was oh. my neighbor. She lives in the house next to mine. And I've attended her. I mean, I still remember uh, opening the balcony of my house just to listening to her rehearsing Madame Butterfly. And I love her. <gasps> Oh my gosh, that's amazing! Oh, really? I mean, that was, I mean, maybe that's the reason I'm in opera, and I, I forgot it. Okay, we're going to thank her. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you. That's awesome. Oh my goodness gracious, that's amazing. Okay, what is one thing that most people do not know about you? Uh, do not know about me? Mm, mm -mm. No, I, I'm, 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 I'm an, I think everybody knows everything about me. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not that. I, I don't think that one of my problems is to, I mean, I say everything. I'm, very, I'm an open door. You are pretty open. <laughs> okay, so, so then maybe what is, what is a, a talent that people don't know you possess? Oh, good one, Sandra. Well, oh maybe um, I love reading. I love, uh, I love, uh, yes, I would say I love, all, all, everybody know most people know me about opera, but I, the real thing I love, really a lot is theater i love dance and i and i love music maybe that that brings me to opera very in a, in a very natural way but maybe they what they don't know is that i used to i i love writing about theater cool. i really love writing about theater okay carrie okay this is a total random question but if you were in america what is your favorite food to eat here <laughs> to eat to eat. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, living in Madrid, I think I'm obliged to say that a cocido. Okay, but if, but if you travel to the United States, yeah. you're in New if York I travel City. to the United States, but I mean, in the United States, you find everything. Maybe, maybe not a cocido, but I would say Japanese food. I love American food as well. Why not? Uh, you like fabulous, food. I'm sorry. You're a real foodie. Burger. What, why not? A burger. You're a real foodie, aren't you? You like, you like I good love, food. I mean, if it's a good one, I'm very Good. open to any national experience in the world. I mean, I love really all of it. How are we not friends? I'm sorry. Like, I'm telling I'm you. so much fun hanging out with you. Okay. Are you all for that Well, and we Carrie, to, he does like we wine too. go to restaurants together. Yeah, yes. absolutely. And he likes good wine too, Carrie. So yeah, like I'm it. telling you. Yeah. We're best friends. Three words that would describe you. Um, or oh, three, three words that would describe you. Okay. Uh, I would say I'm persistent. Uh, I try to, I, I try to be very, I mean, to have my team very much uh, around me. Mm -hmm. And I try that decisions are done in a way that very often I love more to be an inspiration than the one who says that's going to be like this. Gotcha. Inspirational. Okay, great. And the last question. Yep. Go for it. Okay. If heaven exists, what do you want to hear God say as you walk through the pearly gates? Oh my God. Maybe I, I will answer with a, a quotation of Bertolt Brecht. That okay. In a, in a certain, in a, in a certain way, they said, what, what do you want that in your, in the, in the cemetery, in the, what, what says, and he said, I just want that it says he tried to do things. Beautiful. 
And on that note, we will let you get back. But thank you, Juan, for doing this. Thank really. you. And it, it's so Thanks. lovely to see you again. Yeah. Thanks for the invitation. And we need to go to do that tour of restaurants together. Absolutely. Yes. I'm ready. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, the restaurants in Madrid. Oh, I've been there. Oh, uh, amazing. Well, we, will, we will find yeah. good ones everywhere. But yes, I love it. So amazing. Thank you. Thank good you. luck with the Rusalka Thank next, you. right? Thanks. And, and, and we will be in touch. Okay, Juan? And thank, thank you for you. what you're doing. Thanks a lot. Okay. Ciao. Kisses Ciao. to everybody there. Ciao. <laughs>